Okay, what I want to start this discussion with is the keto enol tautomerism one more time. Uh, I showed you in class that if you have a ketone, if you have a ketone, and if you can draw out its enol, so we know that ketones can reorganize, they can rearrange themselves going through the 1-3 um, hydrogen shift, as we called uh, back in organic 1. And these are both called as, this is the enol, this is the ketone, and we called the process the keto-enol tautomerism. And uh, what that means is uh, it essentially stems from the Greek word taro, which means same. And meros meaning part. So the individual ketone and enol forms are called as taromers. And the process of the change in the position of the hydrogen atom, this hydrogen is what we are talking about, that has gone from one, two, three to the third position. And we call the process the tautomerism. I do want you to take a moment and note the difference between tautomers and resonance forms. Tautomers are basically constitutional isomers. They're different compounds. They have different structures. Essentially, you have moved an entire hydrogen from one position to the other. On the other hand, resonance forms, they are basically different representations of the same compound. So when we say that there is resonance in, let's say, you say that the negative charge comes in, these electrons move, and this is resonance stabilized. In other words, you have the negative charge that is shared between uh, all of those uh, atoms, right? Uh, so that's what we call resonance. So they are different forms of the same compound. Uh, on the other hand, if you're thinking about tautomers, this is where, like I said, these are constitutional isomers, constitutional isomers. And so their atoms themselves are going to be uh, differentially arranged. So atoms are arranged differently. So somewhat like two different ways to distinguish between uh, the tautomers and the resonance forms. Um, uh, so that you can use that in future. Now, we know that when there occurs a ketone, so for example, if you had cyclohexanone, there will occur an enolic form. But it's not necessary that that enolic form is going to be in really great amounts. For example, your ketone is 99.999%. On the other hand, its enolic form is going to be only 0.001%. So uh, one could consider that your ketone is going to be a lot, lot more in quantity as compared to the corresponding enolic form. Now, if you consider conditions to be acidic and you have your ketotautomer, so let's say I put an acid, maybe I have HCl, right? So you say that the lone pair of electrons is going to pick up your proton and there can be an equilibrium that gets set up in which you have the activated protonated carbonyl. And so when the electrons are being pulled by the positive charge on the oxygen, that's going to render the carbon electrophilic. So now the conjugate base would be basic enough 
that it's going to pull the proton, electrons will move and you would end up generating the enol. So you have your enol that will come from the keto under acidic conditions. If the conditions on the other hand are basic in nature, that means you have a full-fledged perhaps hydroxide. In that case, you have your ketone. So the behavior is going to be a little bit different. The base is going to pick up your alpha hydrogen, which will push the electrons. Electrons are going to move on top of oxygen. So you end up getting a carbon ion which upon movement of those electrons gives you the enolate. So your two um, structures that are in resonance are given through the carbon ion and the enolate. And if you have this in water, then that can pull that proton off and that's how you generate your enol. But if you have a strong base, a lot of times you will see that it would be written down as your enolate, not uh, as the enol for the reactive species because they can go back and forth. These are in equilibrium. So keep that in mind. If you were to consider the beta hydrogen, the gamma, the delta, and so on, so that means farther it is in the chain, they are not going to be considered as acidic because there is no dipole induction that is being caused by the electronegative carbonyl group, electronegative oxygen of the carbonyl group. It's kind of far, far away, right? So that induction is not going to happen and they are not considered as uh, acidic as uh, the alpha hydrogens. So let's consider our discussion. Let's bring back to you the alpha substitution uh, that we have been referring to, the alpha substitution substitution and uh, let's see how the reaction takes place what we are suggesting here is that because you have the enol form of the ketone that is always available because you have that the electrons can be given out on to the carbon oxygen bond and that will make this carbon the alpha carbon rich so you would have at any given point of time another structure in which we are saying that the negative charge will reside on that alpha carbon. And for that reason, now you can use this uh, species as a nucleophile, much the same way as we talked about in case of the aldol condensation. So a general reaction mechanism that one might think about um, in presence of an acid or base, uh, This in this case we are doing an acid catalyzed enol formation, that would be that if you have a ketone and you're treating that in presence of an acid, you underwent uh, the protonation first you would get the positive charge and that can then move the electrons so you would at any given point of time have this enol and then that enol basically makes, so till this time you have this back and forth, once you have your enol and if that sees and starts to serve as a nucleophile, it can attack with any electrophile and that electrophile can simply just get added up. What that means is that electrophile could be something like a CH3I for instance, in which case you would end up getting Your added methyl group would be right over here. I'm going to put down the CH3 in red just so that you can trap. So all we are seeing is that you have that as, a, as an added electrophile, in this case, a carbocation. And of course, at any given point of time, you can 
pull the electrons back so you have um, resonance in the molecule that will look like positive charge now on the carbon so both of these are the resonance structures as can be seen um, and uh, your I minus if that relieves your proton your end product is your ketone so you can show those as your uh, as your possible structures. Um, uh, just like we can carry out the alpha substitution, we can also carry out an alpha halogenation reaction, um, which is also an alpha substitution if you think about it, which one can even do in the lab. So what you have is a methyl ketone. Anybody remember the name of this? Acetophenone. Good job. And so if you treat that with bromine as acetic acid, it can generate the alpha brominated product. Notice that the other side, which contains the benzene ring, is not going to go through the reaction. Um, this type of a reaction has been seen in biological systems as well. There are some algae that have shown the formation of dibromoacetaldehyde, bromoacetone, and the likes of that. So a typical reaction would essentially engage through um, the uh, protonation, of course, of your, of your uh, acetophenone. So that will first generate your enol. And when you subject that to treatment with bromine, because bromine is an acetic acid, acetic acid is your solvent, right? So you would say that bromine is polarizable. That is going to serve as your electrophile. This is going to serve as your nucleophile. That's what we talked about. Electrons will come in. They'll kick out and add on to that Br plus. Bromide is lost. And you end up getting... your alpha brominated molecule. Oxygen can pull the electrons back. That can happen, of course. So there is a resonance in between these two. And if a base comes in, and pulls the proton, then electrons can move and you can show your final alpha brominated acetophenone. There are some interesting findings around the mechanism of this reaction. So first of all, we've talked about this before, whenever mechanisms are written, somebody doesn't just dream about it, they have to carry out experimentation something that can be measured, something that can prove the occurrence of the formation of certain intermediates, and then they reason out why is happening, what is happening, right? Um, one of the things that was found for this particular reaction is that you have to first generate the enol. That means that you have to start um, it, it's not that the ketone and the enol will coexist. You will have to force the reaction to uh, essentially convert the ketone into your enol. And only then the reaction would essentially go through. So that first step where your ketone reacts with some kind of an acid, could be HCl, could be HBr, would have to be done. And um, when the reaction was done, so when you have your ketone or the aldehyde, so ketone or aldehyde or aldehyde, and then we are subjecting that to treatment with your HCl, with which with water typically will or can be shown as the H3O+. Plus. And that will generate your enol. So that is, an, that is a slow reaction, will have an equilibrium. 
but essentially your your OH your H is coming um, in and your alpha hydrogen your alpha hydrogen maybe I'll put down the H3O in black to avoid any confusion so your your alpha hydrogen is getting shifted onto the third position and you get your enol and once you have your enol and you continue to treat that with um a halogen right so that's just x2 so that means that your electrons are going to come in you have so it could be something like br that's going to pick up the x is going to leave and so we said that our product is going to be um over here so your alpha halogenation took place the same reaction was seen if you had deuterated compound so d3o plus so the same reaction took place that the electrons kicked in they picked up the proton electrons moved so you ended up being with one deuterium and so recall what we talked about the isotope uh, labeling that is what is typically used uh, in uh, in uh, writing down your mechanism because it's like a tracer technique you can follow along where that deuterium is so is my deuterium in this product is it in the water layer where is it at there is a tracker uh, essentially which is connected to it it's labeled so that's the reason you're able to track that and that's how uh, typically mechanisms are studied what was found was that the rate of the deuterium exchange was found to be identical to the rate of the halogenation, implying that essentially it went through this common intermediate, which was the enol, which was involved in both the processes. And so um, formation of that uh, enol is a must for these reactions to take place. Now, while the alpha bromination per se, the bromine and acetic acid, that works well with um, the aldehydes and ketones, uh, with your um, uh, carboxylic acids, you would need the presence of PBR3 as well. So it's a mixture of bromine PBR3, which is also referred to as the HVZ reaction or the hell wollard zielinski reaction. So let me just write that down. This is what we were talking about earlier in the day. So maybe I have a carboxylic acid. One, two, three, four, and five. We are treating that with bromine PBR3. And then we are going to eventually just put in water to wash away. And we are going to end up with the bromine at um, the alpha position. So know that esters and amides and acids, uh, they, don't, um, they don't enolize to the same extent. They do, but they don't enolize to the same extent. That's why they need like a little bit extra, a little bit uh, oomph factor. So there is resonance, right? You have resonance in this part of the molecule. You have resonance in this part of the molecule. So it's kind of like a, a self-sufficient type of a scenario. Whereas the ketones, uh, they do have in the carbonyl, but not to the same extent as your uh, carboxyl groups do, which is why also um, your reaction, the way the nucleophilic addition works and the way the nucleophilic substitution works in case of the carboxylic group, uh, the mechanism is completely different. So what I'm talking about is that if you take, for instance, an aldehyde and you subject that with ammonia, right? Um, the attack takes place, you get the generation of water, water is lost. In the end, I'm not going to go through the whole mechanism, you end up with the amine. On the other hand, if you had an ester, if you had an ester, it goes through the sp3 intermediate that we talked about, right? And the leaving group has to leave in that case. 
and so your typical products will be some kind of another uh, carboxylic acid derivative but you won't be able to carry out like a d4 dnp test for example you won't be able to generate those kind of sp2 centers uh, that you saw in case of aldehydes and ketones uh, which is one way again to distinguish between the two because esters are a little bit self-sufficient when it comes to talking about the resonance of those molecules so let's let's uh let's discuss uh just real quick um i don't want you to get stuck in the little nitty-gritty detail of the hvz reaction but i want to throw in there uh, for anybody who's taking like a pcat mcat type of a scenario um we can we, we can do that so we have a carboxylic acid of course and we are treating that with pbr3 and that generates the acid halide and you could have done that reaction with sobr2 as well the socl2 the thionyl chloride that works well as well i think we had a brief conversation about that um when there is equilibrium um you can generate you can generate um your enol so you would be able to one two three four and five enol and the br one two three four and five uh, if you treat this compound with your br2 electrons kick in these are going to attack bromine is going to leave so you would end up with this compound and when you subject so this is these are all intermediates so when you treat that with water the water hydrolyzes the br over here forms hbr water also picks up your uh, proton so let's show that water will pick this proton electrons are going to go on top of the uh, oxygen And water is also going to hydrolyze when it comes back the BR leaves so that you end up with only one alpha ruminated carboxylic acid so let's talk about how we can generate these alpha substitutions uh, in a useful manner and what we can do with that so one of the things that we have said is that you can use a base and the base that we are using here is LDA, which stands for lithium, lithium diisopropyl amide. Now, diisopropyl amine will be this and if i remove the hydrogen so that i have a negative charge that will be an amide anion and a lithium salt of that is going to be lithium diisopropyl amide aka long story short it's very strong as a base i'm calling that a strong base because the corresponding acid which is an amine right the amine which is a conjugate acid is a extremely weak acid that means the base will be like a super base so if it is a super base that means uh, it will react and it will get rid of it will be able to pick up any hydrogens uh, which are kind of moderately acidic right so something like ketone pka of 22 23 it would be able to do so uh, in this particular case because this lda has these isopropyl groups it also is sterically demanding it should be brought up that it should it is sterically demanding 
So in here, of course, both of my hydrogens are exactly the same. So if I put in my LDA, my LDA can come in from either side and it's going to pick up the proton. Electrons are going to move. You're going to end up with the enolate. And when the electrons come in, you add in your R group, the I minus leaves, and you end up with an alpha substitution at the end of the day. On the other hand, if tomorrow I had another ketone which does not have this case scenario, perhaps it has a methyl group already and you treat that with LDA. So which direction do you think? Do you think it is the A direction or do you think it is the B direction that the LDA is going to come from. So does it come from A or does it come from B? I'll take you a minute to think about that. You can pause me. It should come from the B direction because itself, if you notice, it is very sterically demanding, right? So it'll be much easier for the B hydrogens to be picked, electrons move, and that will be a more feasible reaction that will be a more rapid reaction, you would end up with an enolate that looks like this. And if you treat that with maybe ethyl iodide, electrons will kick in, attack will take place, I minus leaves, and you end up with, with your ketone. Um, so that is your, that is your uh, product that you get at the end of the day. On the other hand, let's do a couple more so we know what we are talking about and we get comfortable with this. So let's say I have perhaps a benzene ring. It has a ketone, maybe another ketone, right? Um, and I treat that with LDA. Which direction do you think the reaction will go? For, will occur at and... Um, Essentially, what, what are the things that you're thinking? So a couple things here. Uh, notice in this particular case, you have the possibility that you have either these hydrogens at the A end or you have the one in the middle. What do you guys think? Which ones are more acidic? You should be thinking that the B ones are more acidic. Reason being, they have a dipole induction which happens in both the directions so when your base comes in the base is only going to see the two hydrogens here because they are so different in this case the acidity of the pka of the b hydrogens is somewhere around 10 or 11 and the pka of this is around 23 you can put the zeros of how much that would be what kind of ratio you would be looking at. But anyway, you're going to end up with your oxygen with a negative charge, double bond. You have the double bond O and the CH3. That remains the same. While we are at it, I do want to talk about the alpha bromination, alpha substitution um, under bromination, under basic conditions. under basic conditions. So if you have your ketone and you have a base, maybe you have sodium hydroxide and you have your enolate, right? We are used to drawing that now. You could draw out very easily electrons coming in attacking the bromine, bromide leaves. So you end up with the alpha brominated molecule. The Br minus has left. Now, the base promoted halogenation of aldehydes and ketones is seldom used in practice because this can go through uh, another round of the reaction. So it's almost uh, next to impossible to stop the reaction at the monosubstituted state. 
And so the alpha halogenated ketone is generally considered more reactive than the starting unsubstituted ketone. And uh, because of the bromine group that you have just added, these two hydrogens that remain are going to be even more susceptible for removal, right? And so that reaction will occur faster and it will very quickly give you the tribromo product. So that's the reason that it's not typically used in lab. However, uh, what was done was it was used essentially to generate, to uh, carry out a chemical test, which is called as the haloform reaction or the haloform test. So if your halogen is iodine, it will be called as iodoform test. If the halogenation is bromine, you would call it bromoform. Chloro, uh, if it's chlorine, then chloroform, of course. But it's more useful, it's most useful in the case of using iodine. And what is done is, what they use is, is a, a methyl ketone. If you recall, methyl ketone is any ketone which on one side of it contains a methyl group. So acetone, acetophenone are both methyl ketones. On the other hand, benzophenone would not be. When that is treated with, let's say, iodine, in presence of sodium hydroxide, it goes through this iodination, the sequential iodination that I was telling you about. And now, since you have a strong base in the reaction mix, Oxygen is going to still pull the electrons towards itself. That will cause the hydroxide to attack, which will give you oxygen with negative charge. OH is what has been added. Ci3 is basically what you have. Negative charge comes in and the Ci3 leaves. So you end up with C double bond O, OH, plus Ci3 with a negative charge. This negative charge can pick that proton. Electrons will move on top of the benzo weight. And you end up with CHI3, which is a yellow solid. So if you want to detect the presence of a methyl ketone, uh, you would be able to carry out the reaction. You would be able to uh, run this reaction. And if you do get a yellow solid as your product, you say that a CH3 C double bond O group is present. So before NMR was born, in which that CH3 C double bond O group is located between delta 2 to delta 2.5, this was done simply by using the iodoform test, whether the given ketone is uh, a methyl ketone or whether it's just any other ketone. That's how it was done. Now, when we talked about the uh, aldol condensations, uh, and we talked about the donor and we talked about the uh, acceptor. Uh, so, for example, I'm showing you here the reaction is taking place in propanel. It has three carbons. It is an aldehyde. That's why it's a propanel. The second position is where the alpha hydrogens are. That is what is going to undergo the reaction because your enolate is going to look like your aldehyde double bond in place. This is the active site. And this is the active site for the donor. So when the electrons kick in, you want to, you need an acceptor. And what would that acceptor be? If there is nothing else, then that acceptor is going to be another molecule. That's why we called it self-condensation. That's why we said that the reaction has got to take place under higher concentration, essentially. And so your new product, if you were to number this, that's one, two, three. I'm going to track it. This is one, two, three. The new bond has been formed between alpha of one carbon and the carbonyl of the acceptor. And that would look like, that would look like 
position number four five and six this would be four five and six and so notice that all of your carbon atoms will be retained in your molecule and the product that you end up getting is a beta hydroxy aldehyde it is an ald all it is an ald all hence aldol so the aldol is nothing but beta hydroxy aldehyde which upon further treatment with an acid or a base is going to undergo protonation and then it has the choice whether that protonation is going to happen whether that protonation is going to happen uh, with the loss of the hydrogen here or whether that protonation happens and i talked about all of that in the previous part whether uh, the, the the loss occurs essentially from the right hand side in which case it's going to be um, a secluded double bond so of course as we discussed this is isolated whereas this is in resonance and the one in resonance is more stable that's the conjugated enone that you would generate so whether it's a base catalyzed reaction or acid catalyzed reaction in the end a molecule of water is what is expelled which is why we are calling it the condensation reaction as we discussed and the end product is always going to be the alpha beta unsaturated ketone or the aldehyde and this is the same thing with driving the equilibrium, noting the uh, ketone this time. The only one thing, again, notice you have the alpha, you have the beta. So the beta position does have the hydroxyl group. So it's a beta hydroxy ketone that you have, and hence we call it an aldol reaction. And then that will undergo um, your uh, dehydration to give you the alpha beta unsaturated ketone in this case which will now be susceptible to the 1,4 conjugate addition but notice that uh, this is a ketone right so the reaction um, is going to be not very feasible look at the equilibrium arrow it's uh, it's not very much towards the forward direction it is uh, more towards the backward direction uh, in this case once it gets formed then the loss of the water that's easy you're pushing it because you're heating it with the presence of the acid but before then the reaction doesn't quite cut it so one thing that i would want to suggest here is if in your product candidate if you are seeing um, an alpha beta unsaturated system right if that's what we want to synthesize and if we want to or if we want to synthesize a beta hydroxy system we can achieve both of those using an aldol right and so it might be useful to think about the aldol reaction if our product is that so let's see if we can actually put something together uh perhaps we could have a reaction where i have let's say so i have propene and via several steps i want to convert this propene into perhaps this molecule now i'm thinking well i started with one two and three carbon atoms and how did i get one two three but then also four, five, and six. Oh, sounds like there could be some kind of a dimerization reaction going on, right? Um, one might ask, well, but I have a double bond NH. And I mean, I can make it a little fancier and we can have that um, perhaps as an NH2. How about that? Either way, I would say that this double bond NH could be obtained that NH2 could be obtained from the NH, right? And that NH could be obtained from the double bond O. Oh, look at that. Now my 
target molecule changed all of a sudden to something that I can recognize. And that has become this alpha beta unsaturated compound. So do we think aldol would work out? Sure it could, but aldol requires an aldehyde or a ketone. This is, an, this is a hydrogen, by the way. Um, that requires an aldehyde or a ketone. Well, what if I start with, if I have a propanal, can it undergo a self-condensation? Looks like it could. Uh, that means I have to convert the given propene into propanal first. And could I do that? Well, you know that you can treat an alkene with BH3THF, follow it with sodium hydroxide H2O2, and that will give you a primary alcohol. You also know that PCC dichloromethane gives rise to an aldehyde. What if I treat this aldehyde under aldol condensation conditions? That means concentrated solutions so that two molecules are present real close to each other. I know that the reaction takes place. I should probably put down my age on this side. Um, I know that the reaction takes place between the alpha carbon of your donor and the carbonyl of the acceptor, right? That is where the bond gets formed. So let's see if we can put those together and come up with the structure that we want. So that will give rise to oxygen with a negative. This is my new bond. My hydrogen is in place. You will have a methyl you will have a CHO. I have everything that I need, one, two, and three, one, two, and three, four, five, and six, four, five, and six. I'm gonna go ahead and heat it with acid. That will give rise to the OH, the beta hydroxyaldehyde, which will then give the double bond. I have my uh, methyl group, Let me erase that and redraw so you see both the steps. So I have first the beta hydroxy system. That's my new bond. We were supposed to form that bond between the alpha of the donor. That means my donor is going to be right here. And we have a methyl group coming from there. Uh, so now if we subject that, so again, notice this is alpha, this is beta. That's my beta hydroxy aldehyde. And if I subject that to treatment with just acid and water uh, and heat, you are going to end up with your ketone. And we know that that ketone can be subjected to ammonia to give this amine. And we know that that amine can just be reduced to give you, just reduced with, you can use lithium aluminum hydride if you wanted to, to give you the reduced amine as your final product. Identified, whoops. And I'm showing you another um, uh, methodology here where my target molecule is to generate two ethyl uh, one hexanol. Notice we started with butanol. That means we would have added two carbon atoms with or in presence of a base. It's going to undergo aldol condensation. So again, the donor of uh, the alpha position of the donor, that's the position that's going to interact with the carbonyl of the acceptor, giving rise to this alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde in this case and once that gets generated all you got to do is all you got to do is uh, just hydrogenate just put down the h2 and platinum and basically reduce it and that will end up giving you you want to give the lowest possible number to the uh, alcohol so you have added two carbons uh, in the chain and you have added two carbons in the substitution pattern so overall you have added four of course 
Um, and that's it. So it's a really uh, easy, interesting method to add the number of carbon atoms into your parent chain. Let's take a minute to talk about the mixed aldol condensations and if those are useful or not. So mixed aldol condensations, such as, um, you know, if you take maybe acetaldehyde and propanaldehyde, we've talked about these similar reactions in the past, those will not be useful uh, because both of them contain alpha hydrogens, right? Both of those contain, I'm just going to highlight, there's alpha hydrogens here, there's alpha hydrogens here. And so there can be reactions that take place where acetaldehyde serves as the donor and the acceptor the propanal serves as the donor and the acceptor it's also a possibility that the propanal becomes the donor for the ethanol as the acceptor that's a possibility that ethanol becomes the donor and it serves as an acceptor so there's what's going on is some symmetrical products some asymmetrical products essentially you get no more than 25 percent of the yield Good idea? Not at all. Bad idea. However, you can make it beneficial by locking the donor or the acceptor as the case may be. So you can do it a little strategically. Let's take a deeper look as to how you would go about it. How could you lock a donor or lock an acceptor and hence be able to get better uh, better products, better reactions than otherwise? So over here, we have uh, benzaldehyde. And notice that I have marked that as an acceptor already. Why have I marked that as an acceptor? Well, if that's your functionality and this is the alpha position, guess what? It does not contain any hydrogens at all, right? So the only way that this aldehyde can serve is by being an acceptor. And so if you subject now, uh, if you subject that with any reaction that can perhaps go through the reaction and... Um, uh, such as 2-methylcyclohexanone perhaps, and it is going through the reaction, um, I have my, um, uh, my alpha hydrogens on the right-hand side, and I would use for this reaction, I would uh, use more like LDA type of uh, uh, base, and that is going to give you your product where your um, enolate is getting formed only 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 from the right hand side so your enolate will look like um, the negative charge here and you have your benzaldehyde and you can do this with formaldehyde as well because that is another one which does not contain electrons kick on top of the oxygen on the acceptor so again, you would get the alpha position is what is receiving the new bond. Let's highlight that new bond. That's my new bond. And now I have my uh, acceptor being drawn. And we can exchange a proton upon just treating that with water hydrolyzing that off or you could use um, uh, ethanol to any protic solvent will do and you would first get and of course upon treating with acid and heating it you're going to lose that molecule of water and generate the double bond so as the end game, as your end result, you end up getting the alpha beta unsaturated ketone as your final product. Another way that you could do this is by uh, marking your donor. So if you have your, uh, your molecule is such that you have one region which contains more acidic hydrogens than the other, you could use um, those particular protons for the same um, effect. And in that sense, a couple uh, slides ago, I basically talked about how you could use 
perhaps ethanol and how you could use that versus the diketo product so in this case since there is dipole induction that is felt in both of these regions right Um, there is greater dipole induction that is felt and so both of these hydrogens that you see are very acidic so that enolization is going to take place very very fast the pka of this particular uh, compound is around 10 10.5 or so whereas if you consider just the ch3 which is on the terminal side that is around pka of 23 so that's really high and that's not going to go through uh, the enolization if this reaction or while this reaction with the marked CH2s is going on. Now you might say uh, it could go through the reaction with cyclohexanone. Well, sure, it could for the same reason, the pKa being 23, why would the base want to go in the direction where it is a weaker acid it would want to go with the most reactive site first and so the donor is completely logged and once that enolization takes place that carbon is going to attack with the negative charge the carbon is going to attack the electrons are going to move and you would with the loss of water notice um, you have the O and the H2 which are going to be lost and you're going to end up with an alpha beta unsaturated um ketone again in this case turns out that there is an ester on this side and that's okay now as we are going to continue on this i do want to throw in some molecules for you to uh, consider let's say you have two aldehydes i'm going to mark it one let's say you have two ketones i'm going to mark it b let's say you have the ethyl acetoacetate or acetyl acetoacetic ester maybe you can put an ethyl or a methyl so there is a ketone group and there is an ester group and maybe i'll give you diethyl malonate which of these four a b c or d do you think is more acidic and why of course, when you're thinking about hydrogen, I'm not even considering any other hydrogen. It is these sandwiched hydrogens that I'm talking about. So you have to consider which of these is going to come out first. You can pause me, come up with an answer and see if it matches mine or not. Now, if you consider your first one, uh, notice that there are two aldehyde groups. And we know that aldehyde groups are pretty positive, right? The carbon in there is pretty electrophilic. So if you consider the carbon that is connected directly to the uh, CH2, that is going to have a positive charge for sure. Because you don't have the H's are not going to impart any plus R or plus I effect. It does not exist. If you compare that to what you have in case of the ketone, the ketones, you have these methyl groups which are going to send some electrons through the sigma bond. So they are going to quench that electrophilic behavior to some extent. That means the dipole induction is going to be lost to some extent because you have two plus I effect. If you consider, if you compare that to the acetoacetic ester, you have over here a ketone on one side and you have an ester on the other side. So here you have the plus I effect. Here you have the plus R effect. And that's going to cause, that's going to quench the electron density over here. It's going to move electrons and it's going to move electrons. Um, in case of D, you have of course resonance here and you have resonance here so both the sides are engaged in some kind of a resonance that means that the dipole induction is going to be weakest in case of uh, d consequently the pka of d is around 13 the pka of 
uh, C is around 11, pKa of uh, B is approximately around 7.8 ish or so, and pKa of of A is around 5.5. So that is most acidic. All right. Okay. Let's do the last one in this particular video. So we have what is called as the intramolecular aldol condensation. What happens if you have two ketones within the same molecule? It's going to end up in a ring structure. That means you would have the donor and the acceptor within the same molecule. Couple of things to consider that here uh, uh, would be that you would have a dicarbonyl compound. So you would have two ketones essentially, which will carry out this intramolecular reaction. So if it is a six membered uh, chain, one, two, three, four, five, and six, that is going to end up with a five membered ring. If it's a seven membered uh, dione, that will end up with a six membered ring. That's important to recognize to see how the reaction takes place. Let's take a minute to show this. So I have over here one, two, three, four, five, and six. I could show potentially uh an enolization at position three or position one and i'm just randomly picking that it's the top end of the molecule which is going to serve as the donor and perhaps it will be the bottom end of the molecule which is going to serve as the acceptor you're going to end up with a double bond and a methyl so notice what can happen when the electrons kick in you're going to have the attack electrons are going to move that is going to give you one two three four five six an acetyl group position three is going to be now connected to position five so you got a cyclopropane oxygen has a negative and there is a methyl group uh, this negative charge will be picked up by Your water is going to pick up that negative charge and you would end up with the acetyl group, the methyl and the OH, right? So that was one possibility. The other possibility would be if you make the enolate on the other side. So how about we make it to the right side, the A side and the B side. So that was B, this is A. In that case, my enolate will look like the negative charge kicks in, gets to the donor, electrons move on the oxygen. You have one two, three, four, five membered ring, and that's the sixth carbon. So I'm just tracking the carbons along. And that O minus is going to then pull the proton off. Hydroxide is going to leave. And it's going to leave behind the OH and the methyl. So now when you heat it with an acid, that's what you get and a five membered ring the last time we checked is way 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 more stable as compared to the three membered ring so that is the reason why what is in black is what is going to happen not what is in red and I believe that's the last slide. That is exactly what I show you. Uh, and I worked out the mechanism and you can go through the slide, whatever, however. Um, notice in this particular case, we have shown uh, the formation of the three-membered ring, which after the loss of the hydrogen is going to generate this three-membered ring as against the five-membered ring, which is way more stable. Um, and hence, that is the process that, will, that we will follow 
uh, for the formation of the uh, aldol product.